Hello, everyone. Welcome to Saturday of Astronomy Days, the penultimate day of the event. We're so excited that you're joining us here today. Um, so before we get started, I have a question for you. If technology was possible, where in the universe would you want to live? So answer that question in the chat. And while you do that, I'm going to go through a really quick Zoom tutorial. So first, this program is going to be closed captioned with live captions. If you'd like to use the captions at the bottom of your screen, click the closed captions button and click show subtitle. The subtitles will look like this. Um, now, if our video is over top of the presentation, you can go up to the upper right and click view and click side by side mode. That moves us over so that um, the slideshow is not obscured. You can make the slideshow or the videos bigger or smaller with this bar. And lastly, we want to hear from you. So ask your questions, make your comments, talk to us in the chat. Um, just remember to keep it on topic and uh, be kind and respectful to everyone. With that, I'd like to introduce our speaker today. So Sean Dale is a NASA JPL Solar System Ambassador, and he is going to talk to us today about Earth 2.0. So Sean, take it away. Well, thank you very much, Carrie. I do appreciate it. And welcome, everyone, to a fantastically interesting topic, um, Earth 2.0. Where would you like to live out there in the universe? And is there really a place out there where we could live or perhaps uh, some other creatures not like us might be living? Seems that that's been a question on people's minds for a long, long time. Uh, perhaps it's the oldest question there is, looking up around you, are we alone? And uh, when you think back, it dates, uh, we have some very interesting debates between Socrates and Aristotle in hundreds of years before Christ, where they're debating. Uh, there are infinite worlds out there, some like ours, some not like ours, uh, and there'll be creatures and other things living on these planets or, or these places. They didn't think in terms of planets, per se. Uh, so it's, it's been a question that's been out there, and I suspect it's, it's probably been one you might have thought about uh, from time to time. So when we bring it more to, to the current day, uh, uh, my apologies to those of you who are Star Wars fans. I happen to pick Star Trek for this particular slide. But uh, all too often, as you know, science fiction really does become science fact. And there's a particular episode of Star Trek where uh, Bone, Bones McCoy says to Captain Kirk, in this galaxy of ours, there are some three million Earth-type planets. And of course, you know from Star Trek, they're always out visiting uh, other worlds with, with interesting creatures on them. Uh, the reality is actually more like a hundred billion worlds in the actual Mil Milky Way galaxy where we live. So uh, he was only off by, you know, something on the order of 197 million potential planets. Uh, not bad for 1966 technology, I suppose. But this is where we get an interesting timeline, you know, very much in the present, uh, because it all started not very long ago when we had actual evidence of other worlds out there. So I'm gonna give you what's gonna to appear to be a bit of a, um, an eye chart of discoveries that we've made. I can only assure you that this eye chart I, I'm gonna present uh, could be as big as a football field. There's been so many discoveries in so short a period of time. Uh, Carrie wouldn't give me enough time to present that many discoveries. But nonetheless, it all started in 1992, where we discovered the first exoplanet. And interestingly enough, it was around a very exotic world called a pulsar. A pulsar is basically the remnants of a star that's exploded, but wasn't quite big enough to turn into a black hole. So it becomes this pulsar object. Uh, they're very powerful, super high gravity, very exotic stars. And interestingly enough, that happens to be where we find the first exoplanet. Um, and, and I find that just remarkable. That would be the last place you'd expect to find a planet, right? But in, nonetheless, it's the first one we actually found in 1992. We're far more interested in uh, looking at today's type, you know, our kind of world, because I think it's a natural assumption that 
if you're looking for a place where creatures might live, are we alone? That question I want to keep coming back to. It probably would be reasonable that they're going to live in a hospitable environment. And the most hospitable environment we know of is the one we live in. So you want to look for what we call a main sequence star. That's a star that's roughly like our sun. And lo and behold, a couple of years later, that's exactly what we found. We found a, uh, an exoplanet orbiting a star in the main sequence, a star similar to our sun, certainly not a pulsar. Then it turns out a couple of years later, we find, wow, it's not just one exoplanet orbiting a star. We find a whole solar system around another star, not our sun. So once again, this looks more and more like what we live in. We live in a solar system with eight planets. Sorry, Pluto, we're not dissing you. You're a dwarf planet, but eight big planets. And uh, we found that sort of thing, and I'll show you later in the presentation, uh, actually some examples of, of these discoveries. But that's not good enough. We want to find planets that are actually more hospitable to life. And I think we could all agree if you're in a if you're on a planet orbiting a star really, really, really close, it's not going to be a very hospitable place. It's going to be thousands of degrees and more than likely it's hard to imagine life could exist there. And if you look really, really far out from the star, uh, it's too cold. Everything's solid rock, solid, solid rocky ice. There's just no way you're going to be living on a planet like that. So you look for these planets sort of in the what we call the Goldilocks zone, where it's not too hot and not too cold. And uh, lo and behold, 2001, we find our first planet that actually is in that Goldilocks zone. Then we go a little bit further and say, well, you know, it's not good enough just to have a planet and it's not good enough to have it around a sun like star. And it's not good enough just to be habitable. It has to have the chemistry for for potential life. And for us anyway, water is kind of important for that. Without water, we can't imagine life. Uh, that's not to say it wouldn't be out there. It's just we can't imagine it today. Uh, and even more, more importantly, organics. That's the stuff we're made of hydrocarbon based life. Well, lo and behold, we found it about a little later than 2008. We actually found water vapor and organic, the signatures of organic molecules in an atmosphere of a planet that is circling another star. Now, Carrie, I'll take a step back there and just ask everybody, wow, think about that for a second. We're talking about hundreds, if not thousands of light years away, and we we're able to actually know for a fact that there's water vapor in the atmosphere of one of those planets. That's what we call some pretty good science and engineering. It is so interesting. And so I have a question. So how common is carbon out in the universe? Because we're, of course, a carbon-based life form, right? You, you would say extremely common. Uh, obviously, the most common elements are hydrogen and helium. But as stars manufacture more and more heavier elements, carbon is on that sequence of the elements that are naturally produced in the evolution of, of the universe. So the answer is loads of carbon, loads of oxygen, and loads of hydrogen, because they're all in that sequence of how stars build atoms. And all so, right. So Emily says, so ET could be out there. That's a, a absolutely true statement. ET could be out there. Some people might say, we expect that there's an ET out there. And, and that's really the core of this presentation. And I can't wait to keep alluding back to your question, Emily. The last slide, I think, brings it all together. And, and I'm gonna say this, we haven't found ET yet. So I'm not gonna make any big announcements. I think NASA would probably rather do that directly. But I will raise enough questions where the probabilities what might just lead you to a conclusion of your question, Emily. So then we said, wow, we're doing a great job finding exoplanets. By this time, we found hundreds. But NASA put together, designed and launched a spacecraft called Kepler that we're going to talk about in a little bit, a little more depth later. Kepler was designed specifically to find exoplanets. And you know, when you're, when you're spending a lot of time and energy and you got a lot of engineers and scientists building these spacecraft, they're all hopeful and expecting that 
these craft are going to do something remarkable, right? That something amazing is going to happen. And uh, lo and behold, it did. And I'm going to show you, you know, the amazing discoveries that, that Kepler has brought to us. And that goes back to 2008 when Kepler was put in, in orbit. Now, coming back to that habitable zone, sun-like star, kind of an environment conducive to life, lo and behold, let's put it all together. In Earth size, because size matters, everybody, size matters. Planets that are too big, imagine the gravity. We'd all be about that tall, because the gravity would just smush us. Planets that are too small, or even moons, you might just float off the, the moon or the planet, and that's not good for life, right? So it's got to kind of be the right size, and it's got to kind of be in a, in a reasonably hospitable zone, habitable zone. And it kind of wants to be like Kepler 186F. So lo and behold, about two, 2014, we got one. We know it's an Earth-sized planet in the habitable zone. And you may say to yourself, geez, why is it hard? Why didn't we find an Earth-sized planet early on? Well, the answer should be, you know, when you think about it, the bigger the planet is, when they're really, really far away, the easier it is to see. And, and that's kind of a simplistic way to look at it. But it's harder to find the smaller planets, the Earth-sized planets, not the Jupiter size. And then, wow, we put it all together at once in 2015 and say we've got an Earth-sized planet in the habitable zone orbiting a sun-like star. In other words, it looks kind of like home. And that was exciting. But it, believe me, it doesn't stop there. Then we find probably the most talked about system, solar system, other than our own, the TRAPPIST-1 system. Actually, we have proven, and this has been more studied than any other exoplanet system, seven Earth-sized ex exoplanets around one star in one place, and almost all of them are in the habitable zone. That's pretty remarkable. So Emily, keep thinking about probabilities of finding ET out there, right? We're zeroing in, getting closer and closer to finding at least what we believe would be a really cool place to live, other than Earth. Well, let's keep that timeline going. 2018 was a major shift for NASA. We launched yet another spacecraft called TESS, the Transiting Exoplanet Survey. And uh, needless to say, if you try to say that five times fast, you're not going to make it. That's why we have an acronym for it, because TESS is really easy. It rolls off the tongue. Um, and lo and behold, rather than talking about all the exoplanets we're discovering since 2018, I want to show you some of the exotic things that we've discovered, because we'll talk about the exoplanets in detail in a minute. Lo and behold, we were looking one day around an exoplanet, and we have very high suspicion that we found a moon orbiting that exoplanet. Now, if you think it's hard to find a planet, which is kind of small relative to a star a thousand light years away, Imagine how hard it is to detect a moon, which is generally much smaller than the planet. Well, we've got a Kennedy. How about something even smaller? I think you've all seen comets. We've all talked about Halley's Comet. We've done great programs at the Museum of Science uh, here in Raleigh on comets. Um, well, lo and behold, we've actually found the signature of a comet around another star. And you might ask, well, how in the world would you do that? They're really, really tiny. And the answer is, while the comet itself is small, it produces a trail, that beautiful comet tail. Well, that trail can stretch for tens of millions of miles in space. And that's reflective. And that's how we can sort of see it from Earth. So now we've got comets. Start to sound more and more like uh, our little home solar system. Then we had another major discovery, because you might say, well, what's so special about the Milky Way galaxy? What about other galaxies? Would there potentially be planets out there? Well, we got one. The Whirlpool Galaxy, actually one of the prettiest galaxies to look at through a telescope. We found an actual exoplanet orbiting uh, a star in the M51 Whirlpool Galaxy. So now, back to that question, are we alone? To be, uh, to be not alone, there'd have to be places for creatures to live that, again, are hospitable, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, now we've got one in another galaxy. 
And there are an awful lot, hundreds of billions of galaxies. So start to contemplate the probability that on one of these somewhere, something is looking up into their, into their sky at night saying, I wonder if there's somebody out there, right? Well, NASA wasn't finished. Uh, we just launched on Christmas day of last year, the most powerful space telescope, the largest space telescope, the coolest space telescope, that's actually a pun because it's an infrared scope. It tends to like to be cold, uh, not just cool, but uh, you have to be an astronomer or a scientist to get that humor, uh, I guess, Gary. But uh, nonetheless, the James Webb Space Telescope was launched on Christmas Day. And uh, if you haven't seen one of the other programs uh, at Astronomy Days, I won't steal any of anybody's thunder by telling you it just arrived at the L2 Lagrange point which is basically its station uh, where it will be observing the universe. And we'll talk a little bit more about how that helps with finding exoplanets. Now, if you wonder about the life cycle of a solar system, there are solar systems much older than ours out there. And lo and behold, we found the remnants of a solar system where a star basically blew up so big not exploded, but just expanded so large that it's, it tidally, literally tore apart all of the planets in, in its solar system. And we were actually able to see the signature of all that rubble in, uh, in a, another solar system outside of Earth. So now we can even see from the very earliest days of the solar system's formation, to the very end days where that solar system is no longer a solar system. Kind of interesting. And I'll leave with, I'll lead to questions with what's the next discovery going to be? So Carrie, I didn't know if you had any questions there from the group. Yes. <laughs> well, we have um, some questions. So someone wants to know how far is transit one, but maybe that's Trappist. Trappist one, yes. Uh, let me get to the next. The I know slide we definitely have some Trappist fans here. Uh, and right, right, they should be. You guys are actually on the right thing. Trappist one is is as I said, the most studied of all. I have a whole slide on that in a minute. So before we get there, I wanted to give you at least a small view of how much energy uh, NASA, in fact, all of the space agencies around the world are putting into this discovery. So I think uh, going back to 2003, we had an infrared sp space telescope called Spitzer, which was actually used both in the near and far infrared. And uh, it was prolific at doing essentially direct imaging. It had a multi-wavelength camera, it had a spectrograph, and the photometer is used for the transit method, where when a planet goes in front of a star, it dims the star a little bit by blocking some of the light from the star. And that's the, one of the primary ways that we discover exoplanets. We can measure that dip in brightness when that planet rotates in front of the star. So it's between us and the star. Uh, and that's, that, that's how Spitzer worked in the infrared. And infrared is really good for this stuff because it pierces through any dust or gas that might be in the interstellar medium. So infrared energy can get through all that. So we can see through dust clouds. And lo and behold, you're going to see in a minute, how do exoplanets form? They form in dust clouds. So it's really good to have infrared astronomy. And Spitzer was amazing. Spitzer was taken out of operation in, in uh, 2009 uh, and then brought back because some really good engineers figured out how to take a space telescope that was essentially inoperative and make it operative again. Uh, I could do a whole presentation on, on how they did it because it's truly amazing. And we actually got the mission extended for over 10 years thanks to that engineering. It, it was amazing. Kepler, of course, was the biggie. It was designed specifically for this purpose. Its primary mission was, lo and behold, 2009, you can see, when Spitzer quit, we launched Kepler so we could continue the search, right? Kepler was supposed to run to 2014. It did. And lo and behold, it was extended as a mission. Uh, actually, Kepler was, was, was also extended through amazing engineering. They actually figured out, they lost the, the gyroscopes inside of Kepler. They stopped functioning. And that's what's used to aim the telescope. 
So without those those gyros running, the, the scope would lose tracking. And obviously, if you're not tracking what you're looking at, you're not looking at it anymore. So they figured out a way to literally use the solar wind, the energy coming off of our sun, to stabilize the spacecraft in one dimension. I mean, wow! Can you? I mean, think about this engineering, guys. Uh, it uses the transit method, so it stares at a narrow field of 170,000 stars, and it stares and stares and stares, and it's looking for any of those stars that dip in brightness, and that's the telltale sign of, of a planet. But of course, one dip in brightness, you call that an anomaly. In order to confirm it, we have to actually see it pass three times in a regular period, a regular orbital cadence. And uh, to do it, we, we actually have a camera. Can you imagine this? In those days, uh, this was beyond imagination, 95 megapixel camera. Uh, that's what's actually on, on Kepler. When you've got 12 megapixels in your pocket on your cell phone, but trust me, the, this is a very sophisticated CCD camera. TESS is our newest, we talked about. Lo and behold, look, K2 stops in 2018 and TESS picks up in 2018. It ran, it was supposed to run through 2020 and NASA just extended its mission. TESS is doing the same thing Kepler is doing. It's using both visible and near infrared spectrum. Uh, however, unlike Kepler, TESS is designed to do a whole sky survey. It doesn't look at one narrow field for a long, long, long time. It looks for a much broader field and then moves on and then moves on and then it comes back and looks again. So it's a very different style of looking for uh, exoplanets, but, but it gives you the advantage of a much wider field of view. We actually have mapped 85% of the night sky with tests so far. And then of course, James Webb, our newest edition, Christmas Day 2021. It's in its primary mission that's planned to last between five and 10 years. Uh, it uses visible and near and mid infrared light. So again, it's meant to, to fill in where Spitzer had, had left off. And it's a thousand times more powerful than the Spitzer Space Telescope, a thousand times. While JWST will be used for a lot of different kinds of science, one of the primary things it's gonna be doing is looking for exoplanets. And because of its incredibly large mirror, uh, James Webb, is th that space telescope is literally, that shield on the bottom is the size of a tennis court. The actual spacecraft itself is about the size and weight of a school bus. So this is a very big, capable device. And because of that huge mirror, it has the ability to directly image, peer right into the atmospheres of some of these uh, exoplanets that we've already discovered. And once you do that, you can start looking for that biochemistry we talked about earlier. What are the telltale molecules, the hydrocarbons, the oxygen? And perhaps if we can find what we call biomarkers, which would be molecules that almost invariably could only be produced by something living. In other words, we don't know of a chemical process, a natural chemical process that would produce those those elements and JWST has the ability to peer right into the atmospheres of these planets, as well as discover other planets. So Rebson uh, wants to know what about Hubble and, Sh and Chandra? Well, the, these are great questions and, and, and I'm gonna give you the funny answer. The funny answer is I don't have a big enough screen to present all the various uh, probes that are out there. So Chandra, of course, looking at the universe from an X-ray perspective, uh, that was instrumental in finding, uh, X-rays were instrumental in finding the uh, Whirlpool Galaxy exoplanet because the X-rays are very powerful, so they, they can go much further through space from distant galaxies. So yes, Chandra has, has weighed in heavily. Um, Hubble has been able to do some direct imaging. You're going to see some baby pictures in a minute of what Hubble has found for us. Uh, the difference, of course, is that JWST can see much more light from much further away than Hubble and get much higher granularity and resolution than Hubble. But Hubble has been instrumental. And, and I'm really glad you, you brought up that question because one spacecraft or one telescope is, is the way it was done you know, back in the Galileo days. What NASA is doing today is we're cooperating with the European Space Agency and the Japanese Space Agency 
and the Russian Space Agency and scientists in, from all over the world. Uh, for example, down in Chile, they have some of the largest telescopes in the world. Uh, the VLT, for example, is down there. That's all of them. When we find a really good candidate like TRAPPIST, we schedule where all of our all of our instrumentation can focus on the same event, the same solar system, the same exoplanet. And now we'll be able to see it in visible light, which is Hubble. We'll be able to see it in X-ray X-ray light, like Chandra. We'll be able to see it from the ground, where we have lots more instrumentation to do all kinds of additional analysis that doesn't exist on the spacecraft. And you put all those assets together. And, and I definitely didn't want anybody to forget that ground-based astronomy, the Keck Observatory in Hawaii, as we mentioned, the ALMA down in Chile, the VLT, uh, there are dozens of, of ground-based uh, facilities that are adding to our, to our space fleet. And here's the result. As of uh, like Friday, we have 4,908 confirmed exoplanets. There are 8,460 additional candidates. And that doesn't even look at the vast amount of data that Kepler sent down that, that's been archived. And we actually have a whole fleet of people that are out there studying the old data from Kepler. And they're finding more and more candidates in old Kepler data. Meanwhile, Tess is sending us down a bunch of new data. Meanwhile, JWST is going to come online in a few months, sending us more data. So if you have any interest to do exoplanet science, I assure you there is enough data to probably occupy the entirety of mankind for as long as they wanted to do it. Huge amounts of data. And uh, I read an interesting statistic the other day. Believe it or not, the number of candidate exoplanets is doubling every 27 months. So back to that earlier question we had. Think about probabilities for ET out there. So how though, let's take a step back from all the, the, the craft and, and the like, and just how do, how do planets form? I mean, how does this happen, right? How did we come about? Well, it kind of all starts in this cloud. We call them a nebula. And a nebula is nothing more than a bunch of gas and dust uh, that's out there in space. And something happens that triggers the gas and dust to start collapsing. And gravity at some point starts taking over. And as, this, as gravity pulls that, that gas and dust in toward a central, central area, it starts to spin, it starts to rotate. And this is because of the angular momentum of the gas coming, the gas particles coming in from different angles. And so you, what you wind up with, kind of like a, a spinning top, or if you did a pizza, if you take a, a chunk of pizza dough and you spin it really hard, you know, it'll turn into a flat pizza pie, right? Well, the same thing happens. We got pizza in space, basically. And at the center of all that is where this, the, the star, I mean, it's getting hotter and hotter, because you can imagine all those particles are just running into each other constantly, and they're getting hotter and spinning and spinning, and they're, they're, as more and more particles come in, they get pressurized. They're just pushing against each other until lo and behold, the star lights up. Nuclear fusion starts. And that's the beginning of the solar system. And then there's a process of what we call accretion, where with, there are bands around that star where essentially we call them planetesimals start to form, where particles just randomly stick together. And the more of them that stick together, the more gravity happens. And as they're orbiting around that star in that disk, they start running into a lot of other particles, which then accrete on and they get bigger and bigger and bigger until eventually you get what we call, what we see in pictures of a, of a solar system. And that's basically how all this happens. That's how we came to be. And it would be kind of natural to say, well, if, if that's the theory on how all this happened, do we have any baby pictures? Have we actually seen it happening? And for those Hubble fans, yeah, we kind of did. Uh, here's a, pa a baby picture of a, of, we're looking top down onto what, what's a, a solar system in formation. And you can see pretty clearly, you've got a central disk. Now you ask me, why is it black instead of very bright? The answer is we have something called a coronagraph. 
where we block that really bright light from the star because it's kind of like trying to see somebody coming toward you, but there's a searchlight behind them. You know, there's just too much glare for you to actually see any resolution of anything. So we use a coronagraph to, to block the really bright star. And then all of a sudden you can see what's around the star. And in this case, it's pretty obvious something's out there kind of to the side of the star. Well, you might say it's a planet, it's not a planet, but when you see those dark, dark areas, those are symptomatic of the star running into all the matter in its orbit and absorbing all that matter. So you get this banding and that's the telltale sign that you've got an exoplanet. And that's an actual picture. That's not an artist rendering. Uh, it's a small dwarf star. And uh, this was done by the European Space Agency, I believe with the, uh, the VLT. Here's an even more compelling picture. Uh, we have uh, two planets orbiting what is actually a sun-like star. These are actually huge planets. These are vastly bigger than our planet Jupiter. Uh, so they show up pretty readily. And th this is what I guess you'd call a teenage galaxy. It's not a baby picture like the top one. But nonetheless, these are real pictures of real planets that are literally thousands of light years away from Earth. Uh, I can't get, I get, I, I literally get like the hair on my neck stands up when, when I see pictures like this. The simple fact that we could take a picture like this just boggles the imagination. Here is uh, protoplanetary disks that were directly imaged, two different solar systems, Hydra and Tau. And you can clearly see that you have these bands. And inside those bands are where the forming, the planets are forming and, and kind of moving all that gas and dust, either absorbing it or throwing it out of the way. So you can clearly see not one, but multiple planets over here. And here's the same kind of picture, but now we're looking edge on. So we're looking right into the disk as opposed to looking from on, on above. And you can see the bright gas that, that's you know, out in a disc-like form. And if you look kind of carefully, you'll see that really right, big bright dot. Yeah, that's a planet. So we can see it from the top, we can see it from the bottom. Uh, I mean, guys, there's a lot of really cool exoplanets out there, for sure, okay? No doubt. So a little bit more about the, the particulars that we talked about earlier. Kepler was looking primarily in the, the constellation Cygnus. You can see that we were looking in these specific blocks of areas. Those all correspond to individual CCD elements within the, within the telescope of, of the Kepler spacecraft. And remember, it just stares at them. It never blinks. It stares at the same patch of sky. It must be boring. And again, we've talked about this. It was supposed to be a three and a half year mission. It wound up being six. It monitored 170,000 stars. So why would that be interesting? Well, we know that there are somewhere, somewhere in the order of 200 billion stars in our Milky Way galaxy. Kepler, at the time, the most powerful telescope that we launched to find exoplanets. Yeah, it's only looking at 170,000 stars. So you can easily extrapolate if we find thousands of exoplanets amidst only 170,000 stars. Well, when we get to 200 billion, if you just have a natural mathematical, you know, extrapolation, huge numbers of exoplanets. Like I said, we got enough data to keep you guys busy for a lifetime. And here's the extended mission. Uh, we talked about the solar wind and here's the test mission. The difference being it's actually primarily monitoring 200 nearby bright stars, but it's also doing that full sky survey, which is much bigger and broader than, than Kepler. And back to the earlier question, one of the reasons we're doing this is Tess is gonna give you that first inkling that something's out there. And then all of our other telescopes can be brought in to look in more detail. So it's that cooperative effect. So uh, again, if you're in space astronomy, particularly exoplanet astronomy, Kepler is amazing. In 10 years in space, how about this for fuel economy, folks? It was in space for 10 years and it used three gallons of fuel. I, I you know, I kind of wish my, my car could do that, right? I mean, 10 years driving around hundreds of millions of miles in orbit 
and it uses three gallons of fuel. That That's pretty cool. So in the end, we were actually able to, to look at about 530,000 stars in detail total over the two missions. And uh, 600, almost 700 gigabytes of science data was uh, collected. That's what I mean by it's, it'll take decades for us to, to go back and analyze that data. From the original mission, uh, this, this slide is dated 2018, 2,600 planets confirmed, thousands of scientific papers, and a few surprises, guys. Uh, we actually, while we were looking, you know, imagine the space telescope is just looking, looking, looking. Well, 61 times while we were looking, a star exploded in the field of vision. I mean, and there, I believe there's at least one of these where we kind of saw it happen. So immediately the call went out to all the ground-based astronomers on all the wavelengths they could look to go examine that supernova in detail because we, we literally saw it happen, right? It wasn't like, well, it happened a long time ago and we're looking at the remnants. We watched it happen and Kepler made that possible. Uh, again, it's kind of that, that fortuitous, fortuitiveness of science. You know, we weren't looking for penicillin, but it cured an awful lot of people when we found it, right? Um, and it took a lot of engineers. I always like to, to look at that stat. It took a lot of engineers to send 732,000 batches of commands to keep that telescope running properly. It's a lot of people. So what do we find? This is the next section of the presentation, Carrie. What have we actually found? I'm gonna give you lots of charts and graphs if you like numbers. All what right, well, we have a couple questions, if you don't mind. So, um, <laughs> um, so Matthew wants to know, if we do find life on a planet, what's the chance it's dead? Like it's gone already? Well, that, that's a great question. You, you think about Mars, for example, here. Um, we're, we're pretty certain there isn't anything living on Mars, at least on the surface. Now, maybe down low there's something. Uh, but a lot, of, a lot of scientists, bioscientists, and astrobiologists are contemplating that very question. We would look for the, essentially the archaeology of the planet. Uh, maybe there was life there before. Uh, coming back to that earlier question of finding an exoplanet graveyard, uh, there's no doubt in my mind that if there was anything living on any of those exoplanets, it's not there now, because uh, the star just literally blew everything up. Uh, you can imagine if, you got, if you're unlucky enough to be on a planet orbiting a, a star that goes supernova, you're toast, right? Um, so I, I think it's definitely going to be the case that if there's life out there and if it's if it's prolific out there, there are going to be cases where for one reason or another, life was extinguished on that on that world. It'll be a good question to figure out how we'd figure that out. And, and I think the best answer I could give you is we would be looking for the biomarkers that may outlast the life forms themselves. It's kind of like finding the bones in the desert, right, of, of extinct dinosaurs. So we may still be able to say there may have been life there in the past, but there isn't now. Uh, but that's that's a great question. And and frankly, we, we don't have an answer yet. And uh, Matthew also wants to know, how long has Hubble been up? Oh, geez. Uh, Hubble has had a very long lifetime. I mean, we're talking 20 plus years, uh, thanks to the fact that Hubble could be serviced by the space shuttle. Uh, and as you know, we d went up there twice to do it. Uh, and and brought in, in fact, the first time we serviced Hubble, we had to fix its optics, if you remember. When it first went into space, it, it, all the images were blurry, and, and that was a really bad situation. So we fixed it a couple of times, and that extended its lifetime. Unfortunately, Hubble is kind of running out of, uh, of lifetime left, and we don't have a space shuttle to go get it and fix it again. So hence JWST. Yeah, I know a few years ago we had a, um, I think it was, it was either 20 or 25 birthday party for Hubble. <laughs> we had cake. <laughs> you know, um, again, I, Carrie, I love to think of this in terms of, boy, did we get our money's worth on that mission. We thought we'd get 10 years. I mean, picture it, you know, if you buy, if you buy a microwave oven and you're, it's expected to last 10 years and it lasts 30 years. It's like, wow, I got my money's worth on that, right? And, and in this case, we get the science of, of amazing discovery. And so much, and so much more than just the telescopes, right? Thinking about, you know, like the rovers and, and all these things. So 
Good job, engineers. <laughs> we're, we're working um, every day. And, yeah. look, um, and so Sean wants to know, where did you find all this out? Where did I personally find yes, it out? Yes, how did you become an expert on this, Sean? Well, I, I guess you could say I'm a space geek um, and, and I'm a soul system ambassador. So it's kind of like part of the part of what I have to do is, is stay up to date. But to be honest with you, uh, it's it's I just find this topic fascinating. I mean, the, the fundamental question of are we alone to me is one of the most important questions mankind has ever asked. And as I watch all these discoveries coming in, uh, wait till the last slide. I'll just I'll just say that, Sean. Wait till the last slide, and 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 maybe that'll be even more tantalizing than I could be right now. All right, I think that's I think we're caught up on questions now. Excellent. So, what are we finding, and how are we finding it? And and this chart is quite interesting because if you look over here, we have all these blue dots up at the top. Those were the ones that were found before Kepler was launched. And you should notice something interesting about them. They're all in this 10 times the size, 10, 20 times. These are huge planets, right? Neptune and, uh, I mean, Jupiter and bigger. And very few of them down here in this area, which are more like Earth-sized planets. And I will tell you that back in, in those days, sounds like the Stone Age, right? Back in the early 2000s, that's how fast science moves, we were starting to get a little like worried about this. It's like, we're only finding these huge planets and it, it's looking like earth is very anomalous. Like there's not a lot of earths out there guys. And that was a little scary for those of us that really kind of hope to find earth 2.0. It turned out the reason for this was that we were measuring kind of the way we were measuring and discovering was really good at finding big planets and really bad at finding really small planets like earth. And, uh, so we all got excited again because Kepler comes in and look at all this. We're talking about planets that are about the size, one Earth mass to maybe four Earth masses. We find large numbers of them. And the bottom line is, we're going to talk about this in a little bit, but before Kepler, we were using a, a technique called the radial velocity method. And, and what that means is we're watching for the gravitational interaction between the planet and the star. So picture yourself, if I gave you a long string and I attached a 150 pound weight to the end of the string and I had you swing it around your head, picture doing that. As you move this, your body would be moving because of the weight on the end of the string. It would be very, very hard for you to stand absolutely still <coughs> and, and do that. So we can measure that wobble that the planet causes the star to wobble a little bit. And that's what we did before Kepler. Kepler, like we said, uses that transit method that's looking for the periodic dimming of the brightness of the star when the planet goes in front. And lo and behold, that periodic dimming is very well suited to find smaller planets, whereas the radial velocity method is really good at finding big planets. And you can think of it again, take that, that 150 pound weight on the end of the rope I gave you and change it into a five pound weight, you're not gonna move very much. So you're very hard to find. <coughs> so exoplanet size versus the orbit radius. And what we look for here, we have these three kind of groupings, if you will. We have earth sized planets, we have Neptune sized planets, and we have Jupiter size and above. And then if you get really, really close to the star, you're really, really, really hot. And if you get really far away from the star, you're going to get increasingly cool. Now, if you look at this graph, 100 million miles is about the distance from the Earth to our sun. So we're talking about a huge population of planets that are orbiting pretty close to their stars. And what we find is this desert that if you're a really, really big planet, big, big like Neptune size, and you're really close to your star, you're not going to survive very long. The star will, it will just rip you apart. And we find, <coughs> excuse me, in this one case, GL3470B96. I'm very glad they didn't, my parents didn't name me that. It's about 100 light years away, and we've actually been able to measure the atmosphere being blown off the planet. It's, get, it's shrinking, and we've actually been able to measure that. 
And that's that's located right here on this chart. It's five times the size of Earth, but it's really close. That's we're talking inside the orbit of Mercury close, right? Really close. And we also find a big population, and this is surprising, guys, a big population of what we call hot Jupiters. Jupiter-sized planets really close to the star, their stars. And that's weird because Jupiter-sized planets generally should be forming way out. <coughs> you know, they're, they're gas giants, if you will. And they're not likely to form really close in. And yet we find a lot of them there, which starts to talk about planets may be migrating over the lifetime of a, of a solar system, which is a whole nother talk, by the way. Uh, I'll, I'll give you the spoiler alert. The spoiler alert is it happened in our solar system that over the course of time, the planets are moving around a lot and uh, we narrowly managed to survive that whole mess. Uh, it, it's when, when a planet the size of Jupiter moves around, it's like the bully in the play, playground, right? Uh, so interesting, another piece of science that comes out of exoplanet research. So now so, we look uh, at- um, yeah. so, so Jasper has a question about um, GJ3470B96. <laughs> <laughs> How big will it be once the process finishes? Uh, the estimate is zero. The estimate is it will, all the atmosphere will be blown away from the planet. If it's lucky enough to survive at all, it'll be a rocky core. And uh, Matthew, great question, because there is a whole body, a whole theory out there right now that explains this, this very large population of kind of rocky small worlds really close to their stars that maybe these are the remnants of these hot Jupiters or hot Neptunes that wander too close to the star. They get all their gas blown away and what's left is the rocky core. And if it's a lucky enough to survive, that's what you're left with is a really small exoplanet that used to be a Jupiter. So great question. And this just again is meant to show you the same data, but we've plotted a couple of other types of, uh, of discoveries, uh, a whole nother presentation. Micro lensing is actually Einsteinian. It uses relativity to, to find exoplanets. Uh, and notice it, it, it's, it's finding kind of oddballs, right? It's finding the ones that the other techniques aren't finding. So it's kind of good to have lots of tools in your toolbox. You know, you have, you have your screwdrivers, which you use a lot, but every now and then you need that special tool to find some unusual planets like these that hang out in the hinterland. And then we look at classes of exoplanets. So hot Jupiters, we talked about that for a minute. The more interesting ones, of course, are the super Earths and the Earth twins. And that's what I really wanted to focus in on. We've talked a little bit, but, but these are planets that are from slightly smaller than Earth to about two times the size of Earth. That, that's what we consider to be a super Earth. And then there's these Neptunians that are either small or large. And you know, Saturn is kind of in that range. It's between a Neptune and a and a Jupiter. And then we've got these exotics. And, and this is where my Star Wars folks can get really excited. Tatooine is absolutely true. We found binary star systems with planets around them. There's no doubt George Lucas was right. The case is closed. It's for real. And then you've got the kind of these really bizarre ones. We've actually seen the signature of planets roaming alone through deep space. Now think about that for a minute. That's got to be a lonely existence to say the least. Uh, but we've actually found the signature of these not through uh, tests or, or one of those traditional methods. But uh, interestingly enough, these are planets that were literally ejected from their solar system and they roam through space alone. And at first you might say, oh my gosh, that's terrible. And it is, but lo and behold, we have one candidate now that we believe has two planets orbiting each other. And the gravitational interaction between the two planets is actually creating heat. So if you think of heat being necessary for life, which you know energy certainly is, even nomads wandering in deep space alone have a really, really tiny chance of supporting life. And this is when you put it all together. Hot Jupiters, 
cold gas giants far from their 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 star and then here's the fun ones lava worlds yeah we don't want to go there that that's like burningly hot but these are the ones that are of interest and lo and behold there's a lot of them and that's what gives us a lot of excitement now you may ask why are we only going to an orbital period this is earth right about here 365 you know we're out in this range why are we only going out that far you know why don't we see a bunch of stuff out here in what we call the frontier and the answer is that we need three remember we need three transits to say yep that's a star rather than an anomaly well if your orbital period is 2000 days that means in order to to get it you've got to be watching for two four six thousand days by that time the spacecraft is dead so using these techniques tess and spitzer uh really we just don't have the ability to find the populations out here through those techniques so it's not to say there isn't anything out there it's just we haven't been able to find it yet so what's popular it turns out the most popular planets out there are actually kind of like earth and a little bigger and that should uh i believe it was emily's earlier question right coming back to and again i want to keep coming back to that what's the probability of et but there is something really bizarre going on here guys that the two largest spikes we do not have in our solar system and that's kind of interesting now it's not to suggest that th those would be particularly habitable they're not particularly unhabitable but it is interesting to note and these are kind of broad if you look at this the the, the range here one to one dot four size of earth so one would be earth size it also turns when you dig deeper into this there's another anomaly it's called the fulton gap and we see a fair number of stars a fair number of exoplanets that are earth size to about one and a half earth sizes but from about 1.8 to 2.5-ish, there's a, there's a dip. And this is where a lot of the forefront of exoplanet science is right now, trying to explain that dip. Why is it that we don't see that many 2.0 super-Earths? We see a lot more smaller Earths and a lot more Neptune-like sized planets. It's, a, it's an interesting question right now. We don't have time to go into, but it's nonetheless on the forefront of exoplanet science right now. And of course you ask, well, what kind of rocks are we living on? Or are there rocks at all? Well, smaller planets tend to be rocky. Big planets tend to be gaseous. And this is a curve that I really like if you're into this science side of this. We took these hypothetical, uh, what if a planet was 100% iron? What if a planet was 100% rock and what if a planet was 100% water or 100% hydrogen? And lo and behold, here's, uh, here we are down here. We're, we're between rock and iron. That, that's Earth and Venus. And then we get way up here with uh, Jupiter and Saturn, very gaseous. And notice the curve that as the planet gets bigger, the planet radius, the mass goes up. That kind of makes sense, right? but then it tails off. And this is a very interesting phenomena. And, and this is caused because at some point, the planet gets so big, it becomes a star. If the gravity of the planet becomes so big, it's, it has enough gravity to suck all that gas in, and then it becomes a star. So again, for you, for you Tatooine folks, for you Star Wars folks, that's how it probably happened that originally there was one big star and then a Jupiter or bigger planet formed. And then in, that second planet was big enough where it collapsed and lit up in nuclear fusion. And now you've got a binary star system. So we actually see that predicted. And then we the red dots are the actual measurements. And lo and behold, that's what we're seeing. So this is the Goldilocks zone. We've talked about it a bunch in the interest of time. We're getting close, right, uh, Kerry? We won't go too much into that. Here's the takeaway. The takeaway in we're finding a lot of habitable, habitable zone planets, just lots and lots of them. And 
we're finding that there are lots and lots of exoplanets that orbit main sequence stars, kind of like our sun or a little smaller. And that's important because the most popular stars out there, the most frequently found stars are the dwarf stars. So it's just interesting to find that we're getting an awful lot of, of main sequence stars with exoplanets. And there's a few examples. We call Kepler 452, a lot of people call it the Earth cousin. Uh, so the artist rendering makes it look an awful lot like Earth. It's 1.6 times our size. And lo and behold, we're in 365 days. It's years 385 days. Comfortably in the habitable zone around a star that's just a little brighter than our sun. And here's the answer to the earlier question. It's about 1,500 light years away. And here are Earth-like systems. Kepler-186 is a dwarf star. This is all stuff we've talked about. Kepler-452, this is the Earth system right here. This is this picture. This is uh, Kepler-452. So you can see it's very close to where Earth is relative to its star. So 452 looks very, very close to Earth. And here's a dwarf star with the 186 system. And here's another example where we plot the Kepler-22, again, a G-type star, which is just like our sun. It's a super Earth with a year that's kind of similar to ours, but it's only 600 light years away. Here's an example of a solar system that is very populated. The Kepler-62 system is uh, close to our sun, but it's got five planets in it, and two of them are super Earths in the habitable zone. Here's your binary star system, Kepler-47. Two stars, one big bright one, one little one. And we know of two planets orbiting. Can you imagine looking up in the night sky if you had six planets that were orbiting really close to what you'd see at night? And here's our Trappist system. It's a cool dwarf star. And all of our measurements show that these are indeed rocky worlds in the habitable zone, three of, three of which are like perfect. It's like really, really conducive to liquid water on the surface. And uh, we're gonna put JWST on that, uh, on that case. We're gonna go measure them more. And there's the answer, only 40 light years away. So if you put your, your son on that plane when he was well, on that spaceship, when he was really young, he'd get there in his lifetime. And this just shows you how very similar the Kepler-90 system is to ours. Small rocky worlds, big gaseous worlds, very similar view to what where we live. And lo and behold, when you plot them all, this is a, this is a scale representation of here's Earth and here's all these exoplanets, some of which are really close. Proxima Centauri is the closest star to our sun out there, and it's got an exoplanet about the size of Earth. Wow. And we mentioned how many missions there are studying this. We talked about Hubble and Spitzer and Kepler and Tess. Here's James Webb. There's one after James Webb. There's a whole bunch of them that we didn't talk about here because they're European Space Agency. And here's uh, Keck. And we've got VLT. We've got the large binocular. Um, huge number of, of, of uh, assets that are studying these planets. So back to our final question. Are we alone? Well, one thing's for sure, there's an incredible number and diversity of exoplanets. There's no doubt about that. We now have pretty well concluded that planets outnumber stars, and there are hundreds and hundreds of billions of stars. Up to 90% of stars will have at least one planet. Habitable, habitable zone rocky planets are estimated around essentially about half of stars. So again, think of the hundreds of billions number. We found 3,600 plus solar systems, and we know 700 of them are multi-planetary. We've got over a thousand terrestrial planets. Those are planets that look a lot like Earth. That's what we found so far. The closest one is only four light years away. Hey, that's just a hop and a skip and a jump, right? So we've got the Carnegie Institute that run the mathematical model, and they say there are 100 billion terrestrial planets in the Milky Way. 
Harvard comes in and says, well, there are 17, likely 17 billion Earth-sized planets of those 100 billion. That's a lot of exoplanets like Earth, Emily. And when you boil it all the way down, NASA's JPL estimate is that we've got 2 billion Earth-like planets that indeed orbit sun-like stars. Think about that. These are just like Earth. They orbit a star just like our sun. They're in the habitable zone, and we believe there are 2 billion of them in our galaxy alone, and there are hundreds of billions of galaxies. We found 55 of these, and we found 24 of which that looked like perfect. We found carbon dioxide, we found methane, which are all the hydrocarbons that you need to make life as we know it. We found water vapor. I mean, these are all the building blocks, the biochemistry of life. And we haven't talked about the moons. So I just am gonna leave you with a thought of the moons. In our solar system, we've got eight planets and 300 moons. All these hundreds of billions of numbers that you see on this chart are only talking about the planets. Think about how many moons are likely orbiting those planets, because they're all candidates for life as we know it, or even life as we don't know it. So many thanks to all the folks that helped me make this. Uh, I, the list is much longer, um, but like, like you asked me earlier, I study this a lot, and these are the smart people I go to to get my information. But the most important people of all to me are folks like you guys. So that you come to these things, spread the word, um, and draw your own conclusion. Are we alone or not? Stay curious, my friends. Sean, thank you so much. What a fantastic presentation. We have gone just a little bit over, um, and we have another presentation that started at 1.30. So friends, um, that's Dr. Stephanie Milan, who's the um, a project scientist with James Webb. So we are gonna say, Goodbye. We'll see you over there and have a great rest of your astronomy days. Thank, Thank you. you, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>